Okay. Can you say amen? amen? Well, many of you know this, that I had an opportunity to play football at Iowa State University from 2006 to 2010. I a laugh and joke about this because I started at Iowa State as a walk-on. Now, context here, when I showed up, uh, I was getting dressed in the visitor's locker room, one of 10 guys with no name on the back of my jersey, and uh, they would put me in the corner uh, with a stick while the other freshmen were lifting real weights and have me do stick squats in the corner. Let me just tell you, Division I football wasn't really sexy for me in the beginning. <laughs> As a matter of fact, they handed me my gear on that first day, and my number was 146. <laughs> Somebody say embarrassing. So this is how it starts. And uh, anyways, fast forward, uh, ended up playing for three different head coaches. And going into my junior season, this was when Paul Rhodes took over the program. I had lettered two seasons, and so... It was, it was a really cool experience just being able to play all four years based upon how my career started. But going into my junior season was when I won the starting job at safety and was put on scholarship. And let me just tell you, I was feeling myself a little bit. I had a little bit different swag on campus after that happened. And, uh, you know, that was honestly a personal goal for me uh, when I went to the university. Uh, but it was so funny. God is just so kind. And, you know, by this time I had surrendered my life to him, and I was growing. I wasn't perfect. I was in, you know, in process. And uh, one particular evening, uh, I was in my gear. I was kind of walking in this area they call Campus Town. And, I'm, and some of you have heard this story before, but I'm, there's this apartment complex, right? And so I think it was a Friday afternoon, and you know, I'm feeling really good about my season of life. And uh, a, a couple floors up on this outside balcony were a bunch of of students that were, you know, it must have been Friday after class. Like they were, they were, let's just say they were getting ready for Friday night. Any, you all with me? Okay. And it wasn't a mixture of guys and girls. It was all girls. And so they're on this balcony and they're like, Hey, you know, they're hooting and hollering. And I'm just, man, this is just making my head even get bigger. Like, yes, this is a good season. I kind of look up at them. I've got a little you know, I'm walking with a little bit of confidence, my head held high. I kind of look at them like, yeah. And then next thing you know, boom, I fall right onto my back. I ran right into a parking meter. <laughs> Swag. Oh, man. Put yourself in my shoes in that moment. I mean, literally on my backside, I've got like rocks in my shoes and I kind of scrape myself up. And uh, let's just say this. When I started walking off, that little that little swag in my step was gone. It was just I was scurrying out of there. I was embarrassed. Somebody uh, help me finish this sentence. Pride comes before the fall. Fall. It's, a, it's such a funny story, but honestly, as I reflected in that moment, it was so evident what God was trying to do for me in that season. He was just trying to humble me. Nothing wrong with being excited. Nothing wrong with, with man, being grateful for the payoff of a lot of hard work. But man, sometimes in this life, if we're not careful... We can allow the blessings and the gifts that God has given us get us off course and allow those things to go to our head. And what's interesting is we can find ourselves in a place where we're actually beginning to worship the gifts rather than the gift giver. And here's what I know is that whether you're not following Christ or whether you're following Christ today, we, this is an equal opportunity offender. Pride is the recycled lie that Satan has been using for centuries. Is anybody with me today? And some of you, even right now, you might be asking the question, like, where does pride come from? We first see pride appear in the Bible in Genesis chapter 3 where we see the devil using it to seduce Adam and Eve to sin against God. Most people think that it was them eating 
the fruit that was like the original sin. But if you recall, the devil's lie really could have been wrapped up in this, that you will be like God. Pride was what drove their disobedience. Proverbs 16, 18, write this down. It says this, pride goes before destruction and haughtiness before the fall. So we see here that pride causes you and I to elevate ourselves to the place of God. Pride lies, it deceives, it tells us that we are better than we are. It tells us we deserve prosperity no matter the cost. Pride ultimately puts you and I on the throne of our lives. Is anybody with me today? I like to say this, that pride is more than deceptive, it's destructive. Its main strategy is to subtly creep into our lives while slowly taking away our desire to serve and honor God. I want to give you an illustration as we kind of lean into this idea this morning. And I want you to imagine pride as a balloon and humility as a rock. Because I believe today that that's, that's the transition that God wants some of us to make this morning, is that we've allowed pride to subtly creep into our heart, but today we're gonna put off pride and we're gonna put on humility. Are you with me today? So we're gonna imagine in this moment that pride is a balloon and humility is a rock. The balloon, filled with hot air, floats aimlessly and is easily popped. The rock is grounded and solid and remains unshakable. See, this is what the rock does, is it anchors us while pride leaves us vulnerable. Humility anchors us and pride leaves us vulnerable. If you're writing down notes today, I want you to write down the title of today's message. I'm calling this message The Fight Against Pride. I'm gonna give you three ways to put away pride. I believe that we're gonna see this theme show up in Ezekiel chapter 28. A little bit of context for those of you uh, that are new to the Bible. Ezekiel is a prophet in the Old Testament. This was an interesting time period for God's people because if you recall, God wants relationship with Israel to love them and lead them and serve them and bless them but also because he wants to show the surrounding nations that he is the one true God. But what we know, like many of us in this place today, is that Israel began giving their heart away to idols and other gods, and they got off track. And before long, God needed to judge them. And he does so in 586 BC by bringing the Babylonians to come attack his people, take them into exile in Babylon for 70 years, and as we read these different prophets throughout the Old Testament, some of the prophets were left in Israel and some were exiled. Ezekiel happens to be one of the prophets that was in exile in Babylon. Now, what's so interesting is this book really is about the discipline of God's people, but there's a shift that happens here in the scriptures beginning in chapter 25. What was happening at this time is that the surrounding nations were rejoicing at God's people being disciplined. And we're, we're not called to rejoice over anybody's suffering. So God begins to speak judgment through the prophet to these surrounding nations. And so in 25 through 28, we see the prophet begin to speak these judgments over these surrounding nations. Now, what's interesting here is that a lot of these nations get like a paragraph. But for whatever reason, the surrounding nation that we're gonna lean into today is, the na is, is a, actually a city called Tyre in the province of Phoenicia. They were, they were actually a very um, wealthy and prosperous city. Um, and we're gonna read a little bit more about that here in a second. But the problem was is there... Their, their prosperity uh, caused them to begin slipping into being prideful. So as we look at this text today, we're gonna see this theme and we're gonna begin to see even what God's thoughts were in the Old Testament and his perspective 
for humanity when we fall into the temptation of the trap of pride. Do you want to check it out? Ezekiel chapter 28. I think we need to, we need to go to the scripture and check this out. Starting in verse one, it says this about the prosperous and proud city that was known for its wealth and arrogance. The prophet here in 28 begins to bring judgment against its leaders. In, in 26 and 27, he's bringing judgment against the city. But we know this, that the city was moving in the direction of the leaders. I think we all just need to lean into that thought here today. Sometimes we can you know, come into church and think, oh, that's not for me. Let me just tell you, if you're, if you're in this place today, God wants to speak to you through this word. It says this, then this message came to me from the Lord. Son of man, give the prince of Tyre this message from the sovereign Lord. Here it is. Here's the message. In your great pride, you claim I am a God. I sit on a divine throne in the heart of a sea. Now, I'm going to pause here because um, I think it's interesting. I was thinking about this, about how, about how subtle pride is. And there are many people in our world today that aren't necessarily walking around with a sign on their forehead that says, I am a God. You know, there's not many people that are walking to their office and they're saying, worship me, I am a God. But how many of us are proclaiming that I am a God subconsciously by the belief system that we've adopted? Let me illustrate it for you today. I love it when I get around lost friends that I have, you know, old teammates and different things. And I always laugh when People make a reference to me. They call me OC. They're like, OC, I know you're religious. I'm just not very religious. And it's interesting because even in my own pride, when I hear these sort of statements, I start to think to myself, hmm, really? Here's what I know is that humanity was created to worship something. So what you're really identifying is you're calling me religious because I choose to worship Jesus. What I could say, but what I have to ask the Holy Spirit to hold me back on is, you're religious too. You just worship yourself. And that's the reality. And I say that so humbly, but it's, it's the truth. Before I surrendered in my car in 2007 in a Hollywood video parking lot and bent my knee to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, you better believe it that Michael Patrick O'Connell Jr. was sitting on the throne of his heart. I did what I want, when I wanted, however I wanted. Is anybody with me today? I ruled my life before I bent my knee to Jesus. And the reality is, is what he's saying here to this to this leader is that you think you're a God. You, you think you sit on a divine throne in the heart of the sea. But here's what the judgment says. But you are only a man and not a God. Though you boast that you are God, you regard yourself as wiser than Daniel and think no secret is hidden from you. With your wisdom and understanding, you have amassed great wealth gold and silver for your treasuries. Yes, your wisdom has made you very rich and your riches have made you very proud. I want to pause here even for a second because I, I just, and I want to just come against this lie that like being prosperous is unbiblical. Like, let's just be honest. We've got a lot of prosperous people that are sitting under my voice right now. Do, do you see what he said here? You're with your wisdom and understanding. You have amassed great wealth. Your wisdom has made you very rich. But here's what happened. Your riches have made you very proud. So it, it's, it's, we don't need to feel guilty because we've been blessed by God. But we need to be careful that we don't let those things uh, get us haughty or proud, that we don't start worshiping the gifts rather than the gift giver. Are you with me today? We don't start putting our hope and our trust in our finances or our wealth or our retirement. We put our hope and our trust in God. It's about order here. 
There's nothing wrong with being blessed. There's nothing wrong with being prosperous. Here's what I do know, though, is that when we are blessed and when we are prosperous, I just told you about it at the beginning. We are vulnerable for pride coming against us. That's why I say you got to stay ready so you don't got to get ready. I say the secret sauce is the secret place. If you, if you want to stay humble before God, get in his presence. We got to get in his presence because it's when we are in his presence that we're reminded of how big our God is and how small you and I are. How many of you know that we are but dust? We came from the dirt. Naked we came in this world and naked we're going to leave this world. When's the last time you saw a hearse uh, carrying a U-Haul? Anybody in here? You seeing it? We're not taking anything with us. And so today, would we be reminded that God is inviting us to get low before him, to get into his presence, to be grateful for what he's blessed us with, but to never make that thing a God. Never make that thing a God. So we see here that in the first section of this scripture, the prophet is giving a diagnosis But now he's going to transition and and he's going to start speaking to the destruction in verse six. So because of the pride, therefore, this is what the sovereign Lord says, because you think you are as are as wise as a God. I will now bring against you a foreign army, the terror of the nations. They will draw their swords against your marvelous wisdom and defile your splendor. They will bring you down to the pit and you will die in the heart of the sea, pierced with many wounds. Isn't it interesting that pride takes you higher and higher only to lead to a fall that's harder and harder? Will you then boast, I am a God, to those who kill you? To them, you will be no God, but merely a man. You will die like an outcast at the hands of foreigners. I, the sovereign Lord, have spoken. Man, this is, this is some scripture that is, that's weighty. And we see this diagnosis or this, uh, this accusation. And then we see this prescription, which is destruction and judgment against these people. And I don't know about you, but when I read this, it can posture me in a position of almost feeling hopeless. And it's so interesting because as we read the prophets, there's just some really hard words in here, aren't there? As we continue to journey through the Old Testament and as we continue to hear these judgments that are coming through the prophets, we have to understand as New New Testament believers that are in Christ, the Bible declares this over our lives that we have been what? Crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but it's Christ that lives in me. The beautiful thing that you and I have that these people don't have as that Jesus came to this planet Earth, lived the life that you and I couldn't, and pinned our pride on the cross. Is anybody grateful for that? I know that that puts me in a posture of gratitude because in the Old Testament, judgment had to be taken out on these people. But for us, judgment has been taken out on Christ so that you and I can walk freely. Here's the beautiful thing about being a New Testament believer is that we've been forgiven of our past, our present, and our future sin. We are hidden in Christ Jesus. But may we not use grace as a license to keep on sinning. We we are called to share the, the hope of Jesus Christ with this world. And my Bible declares that the darkness will never extinguish the light. But how many of you know that when we fall into the temptation of pride. It's like, it's like putting the lampshade over that light. And now we walk into this world that is dark, really dim. Today, we're going to put off that pride. We're going to begin shining bright again for the glory of God, not ourselves. Is anybody with me today? Is anybody thankful that Jesus paid the price so that you and I don't have to? So I want to just give us Three practical takeaways today as we think about this scripture today, as we consider the temptation of pride, because in the same way that the people of Tyre fell victim to this, you and I are just as vulnerable of falling victim to pride today. But I believe that today 
there are three things that I wanna give you to encourage your soul today. Number one is this, when pride is insisting, keep on resisting. Write it down in your notes today. When pride is insisting, keep on resisting. James 4, 6 and 7 says this. But he gives more grace, therefore he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. I think it's interesting that the language I'm giving you is to resist, and yet it says in here that God resists the proud. Either you and I will resist pride or we will be resisted by God. What do you want to choose today? I want to tell us this today because this particular scripture is not telling us to resist pride, but it's, it's calling us to resist the enemy, the devil. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. I want to tell somebody today that pride has a prom promoter. Pride has a promoter. It's interesting because verses 1 through 10 in chapter 28 are speaking judgment to the prince of Tyre, but verses 11 through 19, there's a shift where they begin to speak to the king of Tyre. Now, scholars say that this particular section of scripture speaks to a type of Satan. There's a couple verses in this particular section that point to it. Look at this. In verse 13, it says this. You were in Eden, the garden of God. There's no way the king of Tyre was in that place. Jump down to verse 14. It says this. I ordained and anointed you as the mighty angelic guardian. You had access to the holy mountain of God and walked among the stones of fire. Jump down to 16. It says this. Your rich commerce led you to violence and you sin, so I banished you in disgrace from the mountain of God. You guys know this story if you've read the Old Testament, uh, but I want to share a little bit more detail on this. David Guzik says this, quote, Satan's present strategy against man is this, to obscure the image of God in man through encouraging sin and rebellion to cause man to serve him and to prevent the ultimate glorification of man. Now, some of you are thinking, Glorif glorification of man? What are you talking about? Here's what I want you to know. There is divine order in God's creation. Satan rejected God's plan to create an order of beings made in his image. That's you and I. We're made in the image of God who would be beneath the angels in dignity, yet would be served by angels in the present and would one day be lifted in honor and status above the angels. Satan wanted to be the highest among all creatures, equal to God in glory and honor. And as a result of not getting this, he was able to persuade one third of the angelic beings to join him in this rebellion. So when we read about him being casted down from the mountain of God, this is when God's created angel was casted down. And here's the reality. This demonic force has one single mission for you and I's life. Do you want to know what it is? To kill, to steal, and to, and to destroy. That's why the Bible tells you and I to remain sober and vigilant because we're in a battle and the enemy forces pounce on our pride. Our pride becomes a wide open door for demonic influence. So why am I sharing all this? Because come on, y'all, this isn't a playground. This is a battleground. So when pride is insisting, you got to keep on resisting. You know, I think about, um, and sh sorry if this is your career, but I think of people that have to go door to door and knock, loiters, telemarketers. Have you ever had those moments where, hey, there's some times where it's like, I've got time, I want to answer the door, I want to minister to these people, but every once in a while, they just knock it at the wrong time. You know what I'm saying? And you got to have some discernment to say, nope, I'm not answering the door. You and I can't always prohibit pride from knocking on the door, but we don't have to answer that thing and let it in. Is anybody with me today? I wrote this in my notes, and I want you to write this down. You can't be overtaken by something you refuse to entertain. 
You can't be overtaken by something that you refuse to entertain. So today, church, can we make a declaration that we are not going to give any ground to the enemy? When pride is insisting, we're going to keep on resisting. We're going to resist it, and the enemy's going to have to flee. Is anybody with me today? Number one, when pride is insisting, you got to keep on resisting. And number two, if we're going to put away pride, we must remember this. Number two, that God's word in us is more powerful than pride's purpose against us. I love what 1 John 4, 4 says. It says, but you belong to God. Son and daughter, you belong to him. Kevin, you belong to him. Rachel, you belong to him. Dave, you belong to him. Josh, you belong to him. Kevin, you belong to him. Adam, you belong to him. Dwayne, you belong to him. You belong to God, my dear children. You have already won a victory over those people because this, the spirit who lives in you is greater than the spirit who lives in the world. Come on, if God is for us, who can stand against us? The darkness will never extinguish the light. God's word in us is more powerful than pride's purpose against us. Ephesians 6, it talks about it. Go read it. It talks about putting on your spiritual armor. And I love in like 16 and 17, it talks about prayer and God's word. And I love this picture about God's word. It says what? That God's word is the sword of the spirit. This is our one offensive weapon. So when pride or anything tries to come against us, we resist it with the word of God. We use the word of God in the same way that Jesus did in the wilderness. You remember this? What were the temptations connected to that the enemy was trying to get Jesus to step into? It was all pride related. Oh, remember when he took him up over that, the whole land and he's like, I'll give it all to you. I'll give it all to you. And what did Jesus do? He responded with the word of God. Listen, this is why we are so crazy about being a self feeder. Because the way that you and I can tell a lie when it's coming against us is because we know the truth. When you deposit enough truth in your life, when the lie comes against, you ain't going to fall for it. It's just like the people that, you know, that, that, uh, that recognize money that's fake. What do they do? They don't study fake money. They study real money, the real thing. They study the real thing. And here's what I want to tell somebody today. Whether it's with pride or any other struggle in your life, here's what I tell young people all the time. So many of us, we're so tired resisting and resisting and resisting. I want no more pride, no more pride. I'm just going to resist. And some of you are tired and you're weary and you're ready to tap and you're ready to give up and you're just so focused on resisting that thing. How about you get your eyes on Jesus and let him resist it for you? You see what I'm saying? Get in the book, baby. Come on, say it with me. Get in the book. You got to get in the book because God's word in us is more powerful than pride's purpose against us. Number three, write it down. Give God the glory because we're playing a part in his story. Yeah. Give God the glory. The glory doesn't look good on you. And let me just tell you, that our ego is magnetic. Our ego loves the pat on the back. My ego loves when you encourage me. No, ego is edging God out. There's nothing wrong, man, with being mature people that, hey, when you encourage me, thank you so much for that. But we have an opportunity, man, every single time that we're encouraged to point to the one that gave us the gift, to the one that has blessed us we don't need to make people feel awkward, but you see PT do this all the time, pointing to the, you know, to the, to the sky, man. Like, it, I want God to receive the glory because the glory doesn't look good on us. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. The glory looks good on God. I love what 1 Corinthians 1, 26 through 31 says. It says this. Check this out. Remember, dear brothers and sisters, that few of you were wise in the world's eyes or powerful or wealthy when God called you. Instead, God chose things the world considers foolish in order to shame those who think they are wise. 
and he chose things that are powerless to shame those who are powerful. God chose things despised by the world, things counted as nothing at all, and used them to bring nothing what the world considers important. As a result, no one can ever boast in the presence of God. God has united you with Christ Jesus. For our benefit, God made him to be wisdom itself. Christ made us right with God. He made us pure and holy, and he freed us from sin. Therefore, as the scriptures say, if you want to boast, boast only about the Lord. Can we just lift him up a praise right now? Come on, let's just boast on Jesus. Thank you. This is what pride does, is it attempts to steal the glory of the gift giver and forces you and I to prostitute our gift. The definition of a prostitute is to put oneself or one's talents to an unworthy or corrupt use or purpose for the sake of personal or financial gain. Man, how silly is that? We prostitute the gift that God has given us from heaven. And I wrote this down in my notes that your purpose is poisonous when you think it's for your glory and not his. This is for his glory, church, because it's his story. He's making history with his story, and you and I just get to play a part. We're not called to be the directors of this show. We're just called to play a small part. When you see yourself too big, it's only because you see God too small. We got to get the correct view of God this morning, because when you think too highly of yourself, it's because you think too lowly of God. Church, I want to tell us today that our strengths will become liabilities when we don't acknowledge that they're from God. So you might be gifted as an athlete. Some of you might be driving around a nice car today. Man, Royce is driving a nice whip. Look at him. Come on. Yeah. He's like, Dad, I'm going to drive one of those one day. Okay, son. I got some books up here for all you intelligent people. I wish I could put like a house here or a business here. But my pride, you know, they call this, a name for this is, is they call it a pill sometimes. Like throw the, you know, it's like a, I don't know why they call it that, but I call it the pride pill. And there came a point in my life where I was deriving way too much identity from this thing. And I'm thankful that Jesus paid the ultimate sacrifice that God didn't call. He didn't call me to die a, a real death, but he did call me to put something to death. And there's some of you in here today that there's something that you need to put to death. There, there's something that pride has been pouncing on in your life, and it's the vehicle that is taking you higher and higher. But friend, can I tell you today, the higher you go, the harder you fall. And I want to finish today with a story that I've just been thinking about all week as I've been preparing this message. I've got a really good friend that's making a massive impact in the world. And he tells this story about how when he was 27 years old, he's running a financial firm. He's traveling around and speaking to this company. He was in the middle of building like a million dollar house. He had a boat. I mean, he was traveling the world. He's doing all these amazing things. And he would tell you in his own words that he felt untouchable. In his words, he would say that he was overexposed and underdeveloped, that he cared more about his goals than his values and his goals took him to a place that he never wanted to go. There was one particular day he got a phone call from his boss and his boss said, hey, I need to meet with you. He thought to himself, oh, man, somebody on my team must have messed up. Um, hey, can we meet in a couple days? The boss said, this is the kind of meeting where you drop everything and you show up. So my friend drops everything and he shows up to this meeting and his boss looks at him and says, you weren't intentional or malicious, but you were careless and casual. And when you're casual, you create casualties. Today's your last day of employment. He lost everything, all his accounts, everything he, could, he had built, almost had to file bankruptcy. 
What's so interesting is he, pride took him higher and higher, which led to him falling this hard fall. But he would tell you if he was in the room today that sometimes when you're lowest, God is closest. And the beautiful thing is, is this wasn't a setback. It was actually a setup. Because for two years, he went up to Minneapolis, Minnesota, and a guy gave him a second chance, put him in a corner office and said, you're not going to speak, you're not going to coach, but you're going to get your life back together. He began to get in God's word. And in this particular season, he ended up meeting his wife, gets married to his wife. His wife had two beautiful daughters. Now they are the family of four. And here's what he'll tell you. He said, God's purpose sometimes is packaged as pain. And the pain was purposeful because God repurposed it. And now he's reaching hundreds of thousands of people, bringing the glory of God to the marketplace. And it's so beautiful to see God's redemption story in his life today. Now, here's what I want to tell you, friends. For some of you, it's going to take God resisting our pride. Because if you and I won't step off the throne, sometimes he'll get us off of it and it's going to hurt. Or you and I today can make the bold and courageous decision to come down that ladder and humble ourselves before the king today. Do you want to do it or do you want to wait till he does it? Today is the day, church, to humble ourselves. Because if we'll humble ourselves in due season, he will lift us up. Let's stand to our feet as we stand. Second Corinthians four, four, it says this, Satan, who is the God of this world has blinded the minds of those who don't believe they are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. Here's what I felt like the Holy Spirit spoke to me today for this moment right here, for every single person that is in the room right now, for every single person that is joining us online right now, here's what I feel like the Holy Spirit spoke to me, is that the demonic delusion is being destroyed today. Because my Bible says that the darkness will never extinguish the light, and there's too much light in here today. He's in this place today. So maybe you've been a little delusioned. Or maybe like me, you bought into this lie and you put yourself on the throne for years. Today is an opportunity to get off of that throne, release all of that pressure and begin walking in true freedom today. My Bible says 